Okay, I'm, I'm going to begin. Uh, this is the uh, session on uh, the necessity of philosophy. Um, I'm introduced to my left here, to your right, Ivan Zotz, um, um, who is retired from the Pratt Institute, a student of Fa uh, Stanley's, uh, uh, who has remarkably interesting work on the production of space and screen culture, sp the screen as a new mode of production, post-Fordism. Uh, it's an ongoing work and an extremely valuable and uh, I think original project of his work. And then uh, to his left is Michael Menser, who's at Brooklyn College, still currently, environmental philosopher, longtime uh, person known at the Grad Center and the CUNY system, activist as well. And uh, so we're going to be, uh, Michael and I both have uh, backgrounds in philosophy. Yvonne is more in, he hates the term sociology, so I'll just say he's a social philosopher, <laughs> you know, in a way, or, you know, or a part of the socius uh, in, in the Deleuzean and Guattarian um, uh, sense. So I, I'm going to begin, you know, my relationship, I'll, I'll just say a little bit of how I I, uh, how I came about uh, the work of Stanley, how my first encounters were, and then actually the, um, the uh, first time uh, we, we met in person and how we did click. And I think Andrew Long is here who was in that class, maybe a couple of other people um, uh, back in 1989. Anyway, I, I first encountered Stanley's work. I had heard of him, but it was in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, in a basement called Lovett's Basement Apartment, where he stored social text. The first, the first copies of social text. Coda Press was the publisher, and Carl gave me a copy of it, and I read Stanley's classic piece on film, High Art of Late Capitalism, and uh, uh, which was a, a veiled argument somewhat veiled, somewhat obvious at other times with Annette Michelson's uh, work on the Ziga Vertov group and uh, Russian cinema, including Eisenstein. So I read and, you know, I, I basically read a few things here and there of Stanley. But in 1989, I was in New York about 10 years later, and uh, someone at the New School came to me uh, who uh, whose wife was... Um, uh, in the anthropology department at uh, CUNY, uh, Carmen Medeiros was her name, uh, Bolivian. She's in Bolivia now, part of that uh, Morales government, <laughs> and has done quite well for herself uh, in terms of good political position in, in Latin America. Anyway, she said, uh, Ronowitz is teaching uh, 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 Marx. So... <laughs> So I said, okay, <laughs> yeah, you're invited. I said, okay. <laughs> so, so I came up to the Graduate Center and right away we just hit it off. You know, he's going on the board with all these references. I knew the references. So we started riffing. You know, right away we start talking about in between Marx, Sergei Eisenstein, so, you know, film montage, the montage analytic. We begin to speak about Alexander Korzhev, et cetera. So one thing led to another. I kept going to the class. In that class were a lot of luminaries, including Zora Lampert, one of John Cassavetti's uh, actresses. She was the Goya face for a long time. She was also part of the Cassavetti's uh, film troupe, uh, as well as Lynn Tillman, the poet, Andrew Long, who's sitting back there. And this morphed into what was called the Everyday Life Group. And Michael Menser was at, at, uh, at um, the um, Graduate Center then. And, uh, you know, we started this group and uh, I don't know, Michael didn't come that often. He didn't need to. I needed to do it. But anyway, <laughs> and uh, Andrew Long was part of that group. We had a lot of people that started out, began reading um, Heidegger, Henri Lefebvre, Jean-Paul Sartre, among others, for a number of years. And this began a very long and I think very fruitful intellectual encounter and dialogue that uh, lasted till his, you know, last days. You know, I, I was always there uh, for the last five years of his life after the stroke, et cetera. Um, our relationship was mostly about, uh, you know, philosophical issues, but also span culture, you know, cultural issues, 
film issues, politics. We were both kind of political junkies. We used to get bets on who's going to be confirmed to the Supreme Court or, you know, these kind of little things. Well, sports at times. So we, we, we basically, as he liked to say, covered the waterfront as much as we could. So what, what I'd like to do today um, is, is two things, kind of give a background of how Stanley was formed philosophically, or at least some of the major influences, certainly Cornell West in the beginning alluded to, um, you know, some of their early common interests, such as Georgie e. Lukacs, maybe give a little bit background about this, uh, Stanley's time at the Jefferson School, and, uh, you know, how he became Stanley Aronowitz, in a sense, and then how he changed with the times, et cetera. And I'll offer you something. I wrote something. There, there is a memorial issue coming out from a social text. I wrote a piece and I'll, I'll read you one of the proposals in that piece about maybe how to periodize Stanley's work. Because for me, the breadth and the, the vastness of this production is uh, quite mind, mind uh, you know, um, uh, blowing. You know, the, this is a person that met, wrote over 30 books. And, you know, they're theoretical books or what we also like to call occasional books, et cetera. And I think for him, philosophy was really theory. This is what he was always doing, was, was philosophy. So the necessity of philosophy, the title comes from the second uh, chapter of The Crisis in Historical Materialism, which was 1981. It shook up a lot of people. I know Sonia Sayers will remember this. Uh, a lot of people, Stanley's not a Marxist. Stanley sold out. What's he doing, et cetera, et cetera. The crisis started a whole new, I think, chapter in Stanley's uh, position, if you will, on, on the left after false promises. You know, before that, the reputation very sound. But there were a lot of people that came, came uh, after him on this book. This was a book that really tried to philosophically engage some of the questions of historical materialism. And remember, this was not the crisis of capitalism or the tendency of the rate of profit to fall or the labor theory of value and its tendencies, as Rick Wolf referred to earlier today. This was the question of the crisis within historical materialism, how Marxism had become at least in Stanley's mind, I use a phrase he uses, uses later, the ideology of economic determinism, on one hand, a very orthodox view that took its premises from economic uh, arguments and economic uh, determinants. And also another thing that he used later, which uh, we can certainly talk about politically today in both this session and the next session and in the future, something he called the mass psychology of li liberalism. You know, how this became not the mass psychology of fascism in the United States, but a kind of mass psychology of liberalism, the play, obviously, on Wilhelm Reich. So, but to go back, uh, as I mentioned earlier this morning when uh, Cornell was speaking and uh, a little bit, uh, um, yeah, earlier in the day, Stanley went to uh, the Jefferson School. And I think this was a very transformative moment for him because he had been at the LaGuardia School for the Arts alongside the Jefferson School. Right? And there he began to study philosophy. He read all of Aristotle's logic, the organon, the posterior, and the prior analytics. And for those of you who don't know, Karl Marx himself died with a copy of Aristotle's analytics on his lap in ancient Greek, nonetheless. So anyway, so this was used in the schools, Aristotle as the materialist philosopher, systematic materialist philosopher of the um, of the uh, ancient period was very much taught in these very advanced, uh, you know, quote, communist schools, if you will, at that time. And I think this was a very, a very significant uh, uh, change for Stanley, even though he grew up in a kind of one part of his family, labor aristocracy, and another, you know, um, as was mentioned earlier today, uh, Port Authority employee, his father. His mother was a garment worker. She used to go collect the dues, by the way. You know, we were talking about Chekhov earlier. He, she went around to actually put get the dues in the hand, which is something that might come back, might reignite uh, unions, you know, some touch of the money to the hand and how are you, I see a face or something like that. But, but anyway... So in this school, you know, he was exposed to the pre-Socratics, and he used to love to say, you know, Anaximander, you know, um, 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 of course, uh, Thales, uh, Heraclitus, Parmenides, he would go through the whole list of the pre-Socratics, the work on Aristotle, and then, of course, Marx. 
After that, he went to work. Right? He, you know, he got kicked out of Brooklyn College, as you probably know, uh, for agitating, for uh, debating with the administration. And uh, during that period, I think a real transformation, again, took Stanley over. He used to go to the New York Public Library every day after his work or the public library and read. And his first readings were in political economy. He read voraciously the Marx, the Ricardo, you know, and Rick Wolf was mentioning this earlier today about, um, you know, the critiques of political economy um, uh, that, that Marx th did. Stanley loved that book and always emphasized the critique of political economy. Yeah. And he actually writes a piece, The End of Political Economy, here too, that we can certainly discuss that, you know. Um, and during this time, too, he starts to read philosophy. He meets, uh, by the way, uh, years later, after the work with uh, Bayard Rustin, the anti, uh, the jobs, watch for jobs, the anti-war movements of the 60s. In the early 70s, a study group is formed around George E. Lukács' History and Class Consciousness. And this was the most significant book to Stanley and some significant philosophical encounter. Very, very much. Right. And. Um, you know, I don't think Stanley sat there and would go through all the uh, the uh, turgidness and, uh, you know, plateaus and valleys of the critique of pure reason of Kant. But through Lukács, I think he understood this very well. We used to talk about this. He would be able to talk about the transcendental deduction as a signified, right, <laughs> in a sense. And he would deconstruct from there. So he had this really synthetic ability and it's almost a clarity of vision in the immediate sense that could really get to the heart of the matter. And I think this gave him a tremendous advantage when he would read, quote, the first classic work, uh, certainly in my, I think in the, all the Marxist tradition of philosophy, the most classic work of all history and class consciousness, you know, that he, that he read. So he was able to understand the antinomies, you know, of, of reason that are going on in that, in that chapter, uh, the, the class consciousness of the proletariat, legality and illegality. And in this sense, the dialectical mind that Stanley possessed almost connected directly with Lukács' dialectical mind. Very, very interesting to me to see this at work uh, very early on in his career. And for those of you who don't know, Michael Harrington was the first to translate Lukács. He translated the first chapter called What is Orthodox Marxism? And uh, Orthodox Marxism referred to method. Right. And, and, and this this first chapter of Lukács before class consciousness and the reification of the proletariat. So, um, again, you know, Stanley studied this book for many years, as Cornell West said uh, later in the uh, earlier this morning, that, you know, this was a book that uh, uh, probably changed all of them, you know, was a, was a kind of Bible on the left, if you will, philosophically, to raise these kind of questions, to read Marx through, and this came up earlier today, alienation and objectification processes. And I think he really, really took from this in such a way that it, 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 it informs very deeply false promises, and certainly the crisis in historical materialism. But it's informing, informing false promises very, very much philosophically. I don't think he would have written that book without the influence and the study of George E. Lukács' book. Yeah. The other, the other Marxist philosopher, and I'm going to be kind of general, but we can open up for discussion for more specificity. But speaking of specificity was Karl Korsch, the notion of historical specification that specifically you would read historically in a context, and this is where you would look at the formation of a concept, you know, what it meant at that time, how it had been transformed, et cetera. And this is in a book called Marxism and Philosophy that Korsh did. Uh, Korsh actually ended up in the United States. He taught at Tulane University in the 1930s, uh, was kind of very far away from the dominant Frankfurt School, uh, you know, in, in a way, uh, um, uh, at that time, he was not really considered part of that. Uh, he was not really considered part of the Lukáczian moment either, the, which morphed into the Budapest School. But this is certainly somebody that he was very influenced by in terms of this chapter, the necessity of philosophy, et cetera. Right? The third figure, of course, was his relationship to Marcuse when they were on the West Coast. You know, very, very influential in terms of Marcuse. And there's a funny story, I'll relate this. There was a group of people around Marcuse that were part of a study group. 
and they would all be vying for the quote master's attention or for Marcuse's approval or disapproval, you know, mainly for the approval. Um, and Marcuse would say, after all these people are yelling, you know, let me speak, let me speak. He would go, let Stanley speak. He loved this story. But let Stanley, he wanted to hear this voice of, quote unquote, the working class intellectual who had some philosophical background instead of, you know, the graduate students at, you know, University of California at San Diego. So th this is interesting too, of course, the Marcusian influence. And of course, one dimensional man, well, very important for Stanley, but I think even more so, and people forget this about Stanley, we have not really talked about this, uh, the psychoanalytic dimension. You know, that Stanley was a very avid and close reader of Freud. Very, very, I think Manny mentioned this earlier today and someone else that Stanley, you know, was one of the few people, you know, that could cross the disciplines and then go into the Freudian corpus, you know, and many good stories around that, including the time he watched Lacan in 1976 walk around the amphitheater in Paris and yell the symptom for a half an hour. And all the students are like this, where's the symptoms? Where's the symptoms? So, so anyway, um, so these are, you know, some of the influences, et cetera. Um, I know that we're gonna, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of limited on time today. And this is uh, really, in my opinion, a very all-star all uh, cast here today. Um, I think that really um, uh, the, the point of philosophy and, and why it needs to be studied today, why the necessity of philosophy, is that both Marx and then, of course, Adorno and others of the Frankfurt School said philosophy has must still be alive or must remain alive because it has not yet been realized. And I think this is a very, 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 if you will, healthy reading of the economic and philosophical manuscripts, as well as the 11th thesis on Feuerbach. Very, very important to keep this mind in mind. And everybody knows hitherto the philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to transform it. So the interpretive and transformative activity has not been lost yet, you know, in, in a sense. You know, we still deal in concepts. We still deal with categorical mistakes. We're still trying to think ourselves through. This is the reason philosophy uh, lives on at this point. And of course, um, you know, uh, um, in, in Adorno's case, he was a philosopher. And again, another story about Stanley, uh, you know, we talk about the activism, the unionism and all of that. But I want to say this after the stroke, you know, that Stanley, you know, I mean, of course, you're going to become somewhat inward, you know, he's in his 80s, etc. You know, and he's leaning back. But the, the books on his table will tell you a lot about where he really was during this period after a very long productive career. Theodore Adorno's Negative Dialectics, right? <laughs> Dr. Faustus, the novel by Thomas Mann, which is actually advised by Theodore Adorno, right? And Eros and Civilization of Herbert Marcuse. And we forget this, this component, this Eros today, or the, the, the relationship, and this has not been mentioned today, of libidinal economy. You know, we always speak about the economy, if you will, of, you know, economic determinism, economic uh, categories, but very few and far between libidinal economy moments. Earlier today, um, Barbara Foley said, and I'm sorry she's not here because it'd be a great conversation to ask about Stanley's relationship to what is considered to a lot of Marxists, the postmodern, right? And Yvonne will speak to this. I'll kind of open this up in, in a sense that Stanley was not one to just dismiss things, right? He read Lyotard. He read him carefully. He read around this stuff. He was part of, a, again, another moment. He read Foucault, you know. I think he read maybe Derrida a little closer, but he certainly knew Foucault's uh, work very, very actively. And someone that has not been mentioned today, except maybe with uh, during the, the last panel, is Gramsci. How important Gramsci was to Stanley. Because I, when I wrote this piece for, for, um, for social text, I consider him, Stanley, the, the exemplary organic intellectual of his generation. There's no, no question in my mind. He came up through labor, studied, produced books, concepts, force of these kind of things, whether 
radical, revolutionary, what terms we want to use. We can have debates about that. I know that when Michael Ferlice invited him to the Hudson um, County Community College, that he presented Stanley Aronowitz as coming to the uh, to, to give a talk here. His faculty says, isn't he for proletarian revolution, violent revolution? <laughs> so the, 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 sometimes the reputation uh, preceded him. Anyway, so we're, we're going to talk today a little bit. I, I, you know, again, this necessity is very, very important. I think another thing that's, uh, uh, you know, of philosophy, why it needs to be read, why it should be part of the curriculum. Uh, well, the next, the next session today is on education, uh, on the knowledge factories, but this notion of the necessity of philosophy, this is the first thing to get out of the curriculum. And I want to just say this, the struggles in France, where they're very advanced with this, kids read Descartes, 14, 15 years old. Derrida and others in France for many, many years, including the International Collage, would put out position papers because they saw the curriculum you know, taking out more and more philosophies, the right to philosophize, right? That this becomes an absolute necessity for a culture to have this as a background, as a base, right? In a sense. So this, this to me, is again, is a part of the necessity of philosophy. Just a word about the essay, and I'll, I'll turn it on to Yvonne, who uh, has some really very interesting stuff to say about the crisis and where we are today. This, this essay specifically was an argument against the role and the presence of Jürgen Habermas. What happened during the, 19, the 1980s and the, and, the, and the 1990s, this new pluralism, this new liberalism that took place, right? He knew this extremely, extremely well, how hurt Marxism was by this Habermasian moment, we used to call it a uh, Habermaniac mania, you know, when, when I was sort of coming of age, Habermania that, that took over everything uh, going on. Stanley is arguing against Habermas, his way of incorporating all these disciplines and is a very watered down, if you will, Frankfurt School, right? Which again, you know, um, part of the amalgamation called Stanley Aronowitz, philosophically. So I, I want to just point out once again, for those of you who are going to do work, and this is really about, again, paying homage to this and appreciating this work, but it's also about his legacy. And today is to serve in some ways about his singularity and how we continue with this kind of work, whether, you know, critical work. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is, the, we're not hagiographic. He hated that, you know, in a sense, he in fact encouraged constructive criticism and stuff. We had many, many debates about, you know, certain philosophical figures and where they yield and consequences. But again, Gramsci, very, very important. And in, in this case, the notion of the organic intellectual versus the traditional intellectual. And, you know, in, in the book, I think it's in the politics of identity. He writes on the intellectuals, I think. I think it's in that book. You know, he has types of intellectuals and he goes by transformative intellectuals. And those transformative intellectuals are Lukács, Gramsci, right? And of course, Marcuse and the Frankfurt School. Whereas and and traditional intellectuals or people that we you know ninety percent of our classes have been with and that we see in the institutions. Again, one other thing, and we'll talk about this next uh, next panel too, is the um, is the question of being in the institution but not of it. Kristen alluded to this earlier, you know, on the labor um, uh, panel. Peter too, and uh, I think this is another important thing that we're going to have to engage. So I'm I'm going to pass it to Yvonne. I've known Yvonne a long time uh, since uh, um, I guess what uh, we started with the Situations Collective, right? Before we worked that, it before that. Like, yeah, I, I, I was always called up by Stanley at about nine o'clock in the morning. I have to be someone. Can you take my class at twelve o'clock? It's on. <laughs> it's on. Denny Da, the pit in the pyramid. I haven't read that in five years, Stanley. Okay, I'll be there. So I met Yvonne through a, a class, taking the class. So anyway, I'm going to pass it to you, Yvonne, and uh, we'll, we'll we, hopefully have a we, very good. We discussion. will we will deal with Heidegger next week, and of course it was Michael who dealt with Heidegger next week. Stanley would just sit there, going, hey. <laughs> very Stanley. <laughs> anyway. Um, very briefly, I don't want to spend too much time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience. I'm sure you're all by now basically pummeled. And this is a very kind of 
cumbersome thing to deal with. So I'm going to basically do a lot of violence to the arguments by simplifying as quickly as I can. But, uh, you know, just very quickly to say, I'm here today and I'm here in this institution today because of Stanley. I came to the, uh, to the Department of Sociology here. I wanted to work with two people, Juan Flores and Stanley. I couldn't connect with Juan ever. And that was that. And I ended up becoming part of Stanley's army. And here I am, you know, retired from it, but still, you know, basically up in arms, I guess. Um, I, want to, I want to point out that this, this emphasis that has been put, uh, you know, out here and there in terms of the importance that theory had for, for Stanley is um, a framing argument. It really is. It's, it basically frames his work. Stanley didn't think that his theoretical work was any different or any less than any activism or any agitation or anything else. He thought it was just as important, maybe, in fact, the antecedent to being able to do things. So when Michael talks about the foundations of Marx, uh, of, of say Marx and, and so on for Stanley, in fact, philosophy was foundational for him. You had to, for instance, understand sociology out of the philosophy that had to be the underpinning of sociology. And if you remember, when you look at the classic sociologists, right? You know, Marx, Durkheim, Weber, they were philosophers. They were formed as philosophers. There were no professional sociologists at that time. It came out of that the same as economics did as Richard Wolff pointed out. So basically it's not just an idle thought. It's not just curmudgeonly Stanley trying to just turn things around, it's actually a historical fact. And he took it very seriously. He took theory very seriously, so much so that he changed the work that I was going to do precisely because he said, you, you need to do theory. Forget doing your work on Latin America and developmentalist governments and cinema and stuff. Do the theory that you're doing. That's far more important. You have to do that. That's the, the work on the production of space and uh, the screen that, that I've been trying to put together forever and never really been able to do it. But anyway, it's mammoth uh, project. But anyway, uh, basically what I wanna say is that what unifies all of this, what Stanley was doing was not so much changing. And here, this is what I wanna present to you is that Stanley was not a labor guy Stanley was not an education guy. Stanley was not a sociology guy. Stanley was in the best, fullest sense of the word, a paradigmatic thinker, exactly the way Kuhn means it. And so I'm gonna connect his work to three figures that haven't really been mentioned. Michael kind of mentioned Lefebvre in passing, but Lefebvre was central to Stanley. The other two figures are not as central. One of them, Stanley did connect, but the other one, he came too late to connect with him. But the, the, basically it's Kuhn, Lefebvre, and Stiegler. And basically you can trace his work that way. It's no accident that false promises is 71 when he's writing it, 72. And the crisis is 81, 82. He's writing in 80, 81. This is the period of transition from what was Fordism to what we ended up calling eventually globalization, flexible accumulation, whatever you want to think of it, neoliberalism. 71, Nixon takes the dollar off convertibility. It's off the gold standard. 1982, my native government of Mexico grabs the phone, calls the Reagan administration, says, 
boss, we can't pay our loans. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the institutions that had been rendered obsolete by the lack of convertibility to gold become the institutions of neoliberalism, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Okay, bracketing basically his transition from looking at labor, looking at the working class, and all of a sudden becoming a full-fledged kind of all-encompassing theoretician. Okay, looking at culture, looking at uh, not quite at that moment everyday life, but certainly the connection between some larger context to not just uh, labor, but also uh, knowledge making, the production of the new knowledge that would be necessary, right? As Leotard is also being asked by universities, uh, you know, Professor Leotard, you seem to be kind of a, an intelligent sort. We have these things called computers. What the heck is going to happen to the university with these things? Oh, it is postmodern. Okay, boom, here we go, right? It's this transitional moment that marks what Stanley is paying attention to in that first phase. But then he moves to begin to work on critique, Frankfurt School, whatever, but again, begins to find a different approach with cultural studies. He's not switching, he's not changing his mind. He is beginning to work on the paradigm, beginning to work precisely on that articulation, that conjuntura of the Gramscians that is necessary if you're going to be an organic intellectual. There needs to be that articulation. Stanley is doing that, it's all unitary. This isn't just the eclecticism of Habermas. This isn't just some kind of fashionable thing for him to do. It's essential, it's foundational. And he's doing that. He's someone who is going from political economy to metaphysics and everything in between all at once, all the time, because it has to be done. And he was doing it. So at that moment, as he's going through cultural studies, he begins to veer in kind of like a second phase of that moment into Lefebvre. And what he connects to is not really the critique of everyday life, although that's what he's paying most attention to in his seminar. What he connects to is the production of space, which you can take as a, an extra volume of the critique of everyday life. And basically what matters here is that Lefebvre was another quintessential paradigmatic, paradigmatic thinker too. Now, I want to address this thing of paradigm because it's one of those things, same as deconstruction, right? I mean, just because you're skimping on bread and you're serving people just a slab of ham, you're not deconstructing. That's not what Derrida meant, okay? And just because you decide that you're going to talk about something else now in your, in your career, that you're having a paradigm shift, now you just change your mind or you basically are now finding a different marketing angle. That's not what a paradigm is. A paradigm, as Kuhn is looking at what scientists do, becomes not just the fact that scientists are running out of pieces to complete the puzzle and they have to find a different puzzle, which is the, the sort of simplified version, but the fact that there is a trajectory. There is what you could call a historicity to science. Science is not exempt from its context. Discoveries in science don't come just because genius A or <clears throat> serendipitous fool B 
came across with something at the right moment, at the right time. There is, as Kuhn puts it in the very first pages of his book, actually, you don't have to read too deeply into it, uh, the fact that there are these different discoveries that may matter to some or others, it's not just this one discovery, but this one genius, right? I think he puts it something like Maxwell's equations might be just as revolutionary for some people as Einstein was at a certain other level of looking at science. And basically that kind of attention to all the different disparate aspects of any given moment to understand how and why things are changing, whether we understand them correctly or not, that's another story, but the attempt has to be done there. That's what Stanley is trying to do. So that's why he can be prophetic. That's why he can be all of a sudden understanding things before other people have written about it because he's basically paying attention. That's it, right? As he put it in one of his, uh, in one of his chapters uh, on a book on labor, parroting you know the 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 stuff that they that they you know used for electoral politics it's the economy stupid stanley took economics very seriously and it was the fact that there was a connection between the economics and the uh social and the cultural in cultural studies in lefebvre and in him that it all comes together. It's all unitary, it's all articulated, right? You have to remember that Das Kapital was just the beginning. In fact, Marx didn't think that that was where things happened. Marx thought that things happened at the level of culture, at the level of the polity, at the level of the so-called superstructure, right? And basically cultural studies was trying to do that. So was Stanley, so was Lefebvre. So is Gramsci. That's why this all comes together. Um, I would say that uh, to the extent that he's writing about space, he writes about space in his book on class. Here it's supposed to be here and there. He, all, he, he mostly talks, he puts space in his chapter, but he's mostly talking about time, right? And basically the... the movement of life in the final analysis is what begins to take him to also look at Heidegger and everyday life and so on, right? But what we all have to remember is that the books that Lefebvre was writing were the critique of everyday life. It wasn't the phenomenology of everyday life. It wasn't the celebration of everyday life. It was the fact that we were getting hammered. When we talk about subsumption, right? As Bruno tried to talk, subsumption is not just of labor. Subsumption is of everyday life. What's happening ever since the revolutions in the mid 1840s, is that capital is beginning to realize that they need to subsume not just the worker, but life. And from the mid 1800s to the present, what we have had is the increasing colonization of our living time, not just work time. Basically now, even our sleep, is colonized, okay? When you have everybody drinking Coca-Cola, how are you gonna get that last M, right? M, C, M prime, how are you gonna get that last M? Well, you run out of physical space, you haven't run out of the time of day, right? Basically, whatever it is, uh, Adderall for the grad students and Viagra for us, right? And so on and so forth. 
televisions, the machine, pills. yeah, red okay. pills. the red pills, no, no blue pills. Okay, <laughs> you, you will never do well in the matrix. I'm sorry, you know. But anyway, so basically, that's what Stanley is looking at. And so, just to finish, because unfortunately, he was not able to do that work, came too late for him. He connects to Steeler at the end. Um, Michael reportedly told us, uh, um, uh, Mike and me, told us that basically uh, the thing that impressed him at first when he heard about Stiegler, is Stiegler was talking about how intellectuals were basically being, you know, turned into proletarians. What Stiegler meant by that is exactly what the chapter on machines meant. And what I'm trying to say is that just like relations of labor were extended to social relations of labor. It wasn't just a society to discipline the worker. It was a society to discipline the consumer. It was a society to discipline everything we do. You know, the appendage to the machine that the workers became is now us in our everyday life. Everything we do is an appendage to the machine. So much so that we are inside the machine now. And as AI gets to be more and more all encompassing, we're literally inside the machine. Right, So it begins to problematize questions. This is what Lefebvre was looking at in his final book, published basically as Globalization is Also Happening, 1981, right? Translated and published here much later, but in France, it's out there. He's looking at how we need new terminology. Think about this. If we're inside the machine, right? If media has taken us over, how can we talk about mediation? If it's immediate, there's no mediation, right? Talking about media now is kind of stupid, right? If crisis is permanent, if this capitalist system works by crisis, it's not crisis anymore, it's normal, right? That whole, all that needs, to, it's work that needs to be done. And Stiegler was trying to work these things out. I don't want to get too deep into Stiegler because it's very complicated uh, work. And uh, you know some of you may have a train to catch, otherwise we'll be here all night. But Stiegler is basically grabbing Derrida's idea of the retention and of the prosthesis, right? That basically our first retention is just memory, right? Oral culture, whatever, can, we can transmit memory. Writing becomes crucial in Derrida because that becomes a second retention. That becomes an externalization of memory. And fascinated Derrida, for instance, was the fact that we could, we could get a writing from someone who died 2,000 years ago, not know this person, and still get his or her memory, right? Well, now we are under a third retention, which is basically all technologically driven. We don't need to know who Bernstein was. We don't need to know who Mahler was. We can hear a performance of a Mahler piece with Bernstein conducting. And as much as Bernstein is a caricature, he conducted Mahler very well. Uh, out, of, out of whatever recording. And as we get deeper and deeper into the technology coming together with mass media and engulfing us, what's beginning to happen is that that externalization is no longer an externalization from us to what we do, but rather from the media to what comes to us. Now all our affect, all our desire, all our way of looking at ourselves basically comes to us from media. And because of that, what uh, basically he called primary narcissism, that is to say that the, the need to, to have some kind of sense of ourselves and sense of our worth is getting completely lost. And he's trying to explain, for instance, how there are these mass mur murders and so on, precisely by the disconnect between us as human beings and 
the world that has completely colonized us and as basically philosophy becomes the way to do critique for Stiegler who was in jail because he robbed a bank and was trying to explain why he did that, right? Philosophy becomes a foundation for Stanley to try to understand these transformations as we get to the point where this engulfing us by the machine is almost complete with the advent of AI, I'm beginning to find kind of the conclusion of the work that I'm doing on screen. I, my argument is that since cinema, we have been organized and regulated socially by screens. Around the film screen, then we switch to the television screen. And there are reasons, I'm not gonna go into that. It's not about my work right now, but we go to the smaller screen and that is exactly the shift from Fordism to post Fordism and then, um, and then flexible accumulation to cop from Harvey and so on. Now we're switching to what's very likely going to be no longer a screen. It's gonna be that environmental computer uh, that that's sort of like the dream of uh, the Star Trek episodes and stuff like that, right? Where you can say, computer, give me beryllium tea and blah, 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 you get the, the stuff. That's what's beginning to happen to us. And we're no longer gonna be basically living around screens. We're gonna be getting organized a different way. And basically that's a new paradigm that Stanley is no longer there to pay attention to. We must do it. This is what Stanley is leaving us with. This is why we're here. And this is what we hopefully will move forward to. Not just for Stanley, but for everybody's sake, which was what Stanley's sake was. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Great. Uh, oh. Is this on? You got me? Yep. All right. I'm Mike. What's going on? Um, I'm uh, I'm CUNY for life, Stanley. I, I owe I owe Stanley in part for that that I'm CUNY for life. I was fortunate to land at CUNY in 1991, not really understanding what CUNY was, and even though my mom's from right outside the city, and I kind of heard about CUNY. And one of the things that Stanley said to me, and we kind of all have our these define you know semi defining or defining moments with Stanley. And one time, I think I got there in 91. Um, I didn't know who Staley was. Someone, you know, people kept sending me, you need to go take Staley's course. I was in philosophy, studying philosophy of science. And, um, and after I know Staley a couple of years, um, you know, this was the time of, uh, of NAFTA. And it was the time of the Zapatistas. And a lot of people I knew, there was a Zapatista Solidarity Network and people were going to Chiapas. And I was like, oh man, everybody's going to Chiapas, you know. And he goes, what's the problem? And I'm like, well, you know, I can't go. He goes, why do you need to go? I'm like, well, you know, radical politics. So and he goes, you know, you can do radical politics right here. And I'm like, seriously, like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you're a laborer, right? You're not just a student. You're a laborer. You're a producer. You're a social, you know. And I'm like, you know, I'm in philosophy. I'm in the abstract categories land. I don't know anything about any of this stuff. I'm raised military. I'm a military brat. I didn't know what a union was. I grew up in the South. You know what I mean? Like, I'm zero. My knowledge is zero on multiple categories. And so this milieu, and that Stanley created a milieu. I see old friends, you know, you get the old friends. This is one of the great things about these events. And there is, you know, it's about Stanley, but it's also about all these other things and all that are crossing through this milieu. And it's discipline, interdisciplinary and, and people in all these different kinds of places. And Stanley himself was a milieu. And when I got to know him, um, like I said, I was in philosophy, you know, philosophy PhD program, which was somewhat interesting to me and just amazingly confining and boring in other ways. Um, and I got to know him in the 90s, and that was after Science is Power in 1988. And, and I'm, I'm bad with dates, so I wrote this down. And then the job was Futures 1996. In between that, though, sorry, job was Futures 1995. But in between those periods, I think was another phase of Staley, which we haven't really talked about, um, which is the development, and, and, but Michael did lay this out in the beginning of a book he never wrote, a book he never wrote, right? Which is, and you just alluded to it too, Yvonne, which is really like, what was Stanley's philosophy in the deep sense of the term when it came to his approach? 
And what was his ontology? What was his understanding of being? What was his understanding of, we talked so much about his understanding, his, his ability to understand the transition, to understand conflict and transitions. And that's why the Jabba's future has these eerie resonances uh, now in this complicated moment around automation and AI. Um, but it also, this, this onto-historical approach, as he used to call it, right? He's a materialist Hegelian, you could, you know, he's Lukács, he's, you can characterize it in many different ways, but he's not a believer in transcendence, he's not a believer in detached objectivity, the individual is not the sole unit of the social, right? It's a embedded, imminent, relational ontology. The philosopher here, if we're going back, is Spinoza. Spinoza hasn't come up. I mean, Bruno, come on. We got to mention Spinoza here. Uh, so I'm mentioning Spinoza, and who turns a lot of things on his head and even can be read through Marx. And yeah, Deleuze was on that too. So there was other people doing that, and we read them. Um, and so Stanley was really operating, I think, uh, from this, if you had to characterize, and again, we could characterize them in multiple ways, and they're incompatible in, in some ways too, which is fun. But Stanley was also kind of trying to put together an onto-historical approach where you're doing a kind of theory of being and, a, and, a, and that's why object, objectification and alienation were so crucial to him, as a few people have said very, very rightly. Um, but he's also, it's profoundly historical. Right? It's profoundly historical. And this has been said numerous times and it, and it can be, continue to be said. And so we can't understand our agency and what's at stake without this really deep contextualization of the moment. But that contextualization in history can't be without its concepts and it's gotta get the right concepts. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about the book that Stanley didn't write with, her, with a, an event right now that I think is really right for Stanley's kind of approach. And that's the ecological crisis. And that's more specifically around the energy transition that we're in right now. Because, you know, the largest machines generally, and as a philosopher of science and technology and all this kind of stuff, um, I, you know, read at length about this, this in this field. And it's often the case that the largest machines, if you want to talk about machines um, on the planet, are grids, is the electric grid. Well, and this is the old fashioned machines, not the new screen machines. Um, we could talk about the cloud. How big is the cloud? I don't want to get into that. Um, so, Right now, we're rebuilding that thing. We're rebuilding that thing. And it's not clear what it's going to look like. And in New York, we've got our own version of it happening at the city and state level. And there's legislation being passed and, and a variety of kinds of, of innovations and, and different sorts of models that are, that are bandied about. And I think that this case of the energy transition really illustrates a lot of, 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 of the virtues of Stanley's approach when it comes to technology and to science. So first thing I just want to say is that there's two different aspects to the onto historical approach. One is epistemic, right? One's the theory of knowledge. The other is the kind of understanding of, of practice and of change in the materialist aspects, in the institutional aspects. So science's power was very much on the epistemic side. And it was trying to, you know, science is an ideology. That's a bad thing, by the way. Um, and because it has this sort of detached objective status that its form of explanation pretends. And it covers over its own, its own context, its own cultural practices, its own prejudices, its own biases and its questions and so on. And in scientist power, there's a little bit in physics on that and there's a little bit on biology. And then the 90s, of course, in the science wars and all this kind of thing, and it was also the rise, it was a different science moment. It was the rise of genetics. And genetics was somehow gonna explain everything at that moment. Different moment now we're seeing the rise of ecology and, the, and, this, and this kind of, the uh, proliferation of the ecological concept, which plays out in different ways. So I was, I helped to co-edit, uh, or I was a co-editor of Techno Science and Cyber Culture, where there was a different onto-historical approach to the question of technology and science that was put forward, um, which is different than in Science of Power. And the main thesis or, or paradigm um, that's being uh, utilized in Techno Science and Cyber Culture is this idea that Science is, of course, a cultural practice, which is specific machines and technologies and so on. And it does not have that de detached objective status that it claims, although, of course, it has a very powerful role to play for good and bad in various contexts. But the other thing, and, then, and this is Yvonne was really getting into this, is this technology separate from culture thing isn't really how it's playing out, right? And I was thinking, when we're thinking about the old utopian novels, you know, the 17th century, the machines were used to do the work we didn't want to do. They didn't bother us in social life, 
right? Then we're just by the lake, fishing, eating apples, having sex, you know, sleeping. Like the machines were supposed to be over there. Now the machines are all over here and there's a, the alteration of time and all these kinds of things that are happening. So that's the, the other part of the book, right? Is that science in, 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 in its own way is got its relationship with technology, but then technology has also transformed culture so that there are these techno-cultural practices that get proliferated, start to shape our institutions and so on. So one could call this, and this is somewhat at odds, just to be clear with the Stiegler approach. So there's a debate here. And I think that Stanley was interested in both and how they play out, we don't know because he didn't write the book as Yvonne said. But this onto historical approach, I would characterize as an assemblage approach. And this notion of assemblage, Deleuze and Guattari, who we had many a study group about um, in Thousand Plateaus, really put this forward. They get it from a historian named Lynn White, one of the great uh, historians of technology, who says, you know, we can't understand technologies in isolation. They're very much tied to specific historical conditions, but also specific plants, specific soils, specific climates, and so on. And there's a famous example of the man-horse stirrup assemblage in medieval times. I'm not going to go too far into this. Um, but this is a big deal. When the stirrup was invented, it enabled a new relationship between the horse and the human riding it. And that allowed these things to carry weapons of larger sizes and also then use plows. And this changed agriculture. And that led to different social status for those things called knights, which now we you know, talk about uh, and see the films about uh, as, as in, informs our, how we represent the medieval period to ourselves. So there are these assemblages that emerge, and this is consistent with the anti-determinism or the that people have been pointing out quite rightly, in my view, uh, throughout the day. And there, I mean, are they historical accidents? I mean, in certain senses, yes, it's not planned by the humans, and, and it's not like certain groups benefit from that, and certain groups get very good at appropriating the benefits from these assemblages. But those groups didn't create the assemblages. There are these kinds of resonances that happen. And this maybe is at odds with, you know, the way people understand a lot of other Stanley stuff. But in any case, this is this book that I think that hasn't been written, uh, that Stanley didn't write. This is the, the ontology of it. And I think now, you know, when we think about assemblages, we could think about um, the iPhone, right, as a kind of uh, defining assemblage, which figures out how to put the screen on the phone and then connect it with GPS and connected with the apps. And then this kind of configuration, which has its you know, intense nightmares uh, dimensions, which changes our conception of time, tracks our sleep and all these other things, then becomes part of this new milieu in which our new epoch or however you want to characterize it, in which capitalism is doing its thing. And the alternatives are trying to grapple with that relative to what they're trying to do. And again, it's indeterminate, but it doesn't mean that certain forms of life aren't being screwed over by other forms of life. It's not like everything's up for grabs. It's, it's you know, they're, they're, they're the hierarchies among these assemblages. So I think that in this moment, with the energy transition, just to get, and I'll just, this is my last example, and then we can have some discussion, hopefully, as you can see this around solar panels. And, you know, I, I come out of the, the anarchist tradition, so that was always a lot of fun for Stanley, who used to pick on me a lot quite uh, in the 90s. Um, yeah, all of you did. Thank you, right. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, and I, you've seen anarchists argue this you've seen, for a long time, you've seen libertarians ar argue this, and now you see uh, homeowners on Long Island argue this, and that is solar panels are going to free us from the utility, we're going to generate our own power, it's going to be decentralized, it's going to be democratic, right? And now that we're actually getting the solar panels and the pro proliferating, and we're not even going to go in the supply chains, it's not playing out quite in those ways, and it, it's not playing out in those quite, kind of ways for a couple of different reasons, was that? Surprise, surprise surprise yeah surprise. and so and so and this is this this is this wrong-headed notion that you know the technology is invented and then it de it's determined on what it's i you know how it's going to play out and it has this kind of essence and so what you've been able to see is that you know um who in a few countries the the solar panel help has helped with decentralization democratization and building community wealth and some autonomy this has happened out in germany to a certain extent it's happened in spain to a certain extent um, but in other places, including the United States, it's really been private homeowners that have benefited a lot. And that's, I'm not saying that's bad or, or good, uh, but that's the group that's benefited a lot. And then there's some utilities that have used it to uh, at the, what's called the utility scale solar model. Now, what do those two models have in common? The jobs suck. They're precarious. They don't pay well. They're temporary, right? And some of the, the large scale solar arrays are, are unionized. But what's also really discern, discern, uh, disconcerting about the way the solar model is playing out in this particular US context 
is the way that they're reinforcing, they're used as a kind of renewable energy, which is good, uh, but a renewable energy that's tied to the suburban home car assemblage, which is one of the most de devastating assemblages of the 20th century, right? And we can talk about its relationship to the screen and as, it, as we go to that iPhone assemblage. And so this is bad, right? And how do we break the solar panel from that car suburban home assemblage and put it into a collective ownership, sharing the surplus, creating spaces of renewable energy and institutional spaces for a different model because we got to figure this out yesterday, obviously, in the energy transition. We can't just go to hope for the best. And New York State and New York City are also passing their own laws and offering their own programs on how to do this. And so I kind of, you know, just to wrap it up, um, I want to say that, you know, I, in my current work, and I, and I think it's about Stanley a lot, and I, I'm, you know, I'm a professor at Brooklyn College, um, and I'm in philosophy, but I'm the director of the Urban Sustainability Program. And uh, I'm the associate director of something uh, called the Science of Resilience Institute in Jamaica Bay, Jamaica Bay. And I work with climate scientists. I work with communities. I work with New York City government. I work with the uh, New York State government. And there is a huge role for public universities to produce the knowledge, to navigate this transition, to push for the democratic assemblages. And, and, and you might say, well, this goes into the next panel and we'll, and we'll leave it to that. But why is this the necessity of philosophy? Because our understanding of cause and effect, our understanding of change, our understanding of essence, all frame how we enter into these debates. And too often we just react very, oh, that technology is bad, this one's good, or we thought that was good, now it's bad, right? But if we don't have that onto historical approach, we're really never going to know how to do, have the agency to act, to do the institutional transformation, to bring about these assemblages of these combinations that would empower us. And where's class war in all this? Well, the IBW is on the wrong side a lot of times right now. So that's a whole other discussion. But so I'll leave us uh, with that. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I just want to mention uh, one thing that Michael just mentioned, uh, cause and effect and, and many levels of determination. One thing about Stanley, just going back to his influence, was a consistent reading of Hegel. And if, if you could type him at the end, it could be that Stanley was a materialist Hegelian, you know, not quote unquote, just a straightforward Marxist or a Marxist materialist. There's really a materialist Hegelianism that always thought through totalities, right, if you will, of multiple determinations. He was always looking for this. It was not a simple mm -hmm. cause and effect or any kind of, and he really tried to avoid deterministic thinking at all costs. And over-determinism was one of his favorite and concepts too, right? Exactly, over-determination in the Freudian yeah. sense, and of course then in the Althusserian yeah. sense. So this, this is excellent. And, you know, going back, I don't know how many people are familiar with the work of Bernard Stiegler. To my mind, Bernard Stiegler is the most prominent uh, thinker. He, I mean, he just deceased about a year and a half ago, unfortunately, but uh, the most prominent thinker in the world today on some of these issues, mm -hmm. at least in terms of problematization. And if you think of what does philosophy do? Well, it invents concepts. That's what it really does in a way. It's also a concatenation to put it in a musical language uh, of uh, arguments that you know you're able to pick up on historically, onto historically, et cetera. But it also acts as an intervention, and this is what Stiegler really is is, is about in many ways. And when Michael was mentioning, you know, and very practically oriented, Stiegler himself had projects in Paris that are worth looking at. You know, communities half a million people in the northern parts of Paris out to the suburbs, in which so many of the things that you're talking about were, were talked about and, and okay. engaged, right? And, you know, again, we haven't really brought up certain other concepts such as entropy, but I'm sure you could speak to this. You know, how, how do we, you know, how would Stanley think, you know, Vaughn uses, where is the paradigm shift on entropy, mm -hmm. if a way? How can we get into this new moment outside this mm -hmm. Anthropocene that, you know, is used also by the mm -hmm. ecologists. How do we get out of this moment that we've been thrown into, that we continue to work within? How do we you know, exceed that in order mm -hmm. to see where, where we are in terms of both the planet, what we can do about it, et cetera? 
So these are very deep questions, and I like the way you 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 separated out the ontology and the epi the epistemology in some ways, and also the onto historical. Mm -hmm. Family always had the historical. In mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love to quote Marx. I know of one science, the science of history. That was always already yeah. operative yeah. in everything he did. So maybe, I mean, we can open up to the audience. You know, I, I know Yvonne's work. We've talked about it a lot. I hope he finishes it or yeah. if he needs a push, we should, you know, send him notes every week. Yvonne, what, what, what page are you on now? And those things are very important <laughs> stuff, you know. And anyway, but why don't, why don't I open it up? I mean, you know, the philosophical influences. I think we're really, what we're trying to do here is really talk about his, his legacy and what legacy does he leave to very serious, serious philosophical questions going forward, you know, well beyond the usual standard cause and effect or just the linguistic turn, right? Yeah. <laughs> Formal lot, you know, you know, all the, you know, the, the analytical schools that are de I've thought. suffered under the linguistic yeah. turn quite a bit, yes. Yes, right, right. So, um, yeah, anyway, so I'll, I'll open up to the audience or if you want to say some more, you know, about- well, you know, yeah. since you're talking about the linguistic turn, I want to point out, uh, just going back to the question of postmodernism and Stanley, Stanley really didn't have much patience with postmodernism as it became a fashion after Leotard uh, did his work, which he took seriously, but postmodernism as such, not very much. He was more interested in the post-structuralists. And the reason is that basically they are post-structuralists because modernism ends with structuralism. When the semiologists discover that they're not going to be able to put that system of systems, that Hegelian kind of cage that's going to encompass everything and everything will be classified as a language and we'll just be able to explain the universe. When they realize that paradigm is kaput, we have no paradigm. We're now post, basically. Yes. <laughs> the, and, and, the paradigm becomes, we're, we're not we're not Hugo, right? Yeah. <laughs> who are you? Well, I'm not, just not Hugo. You yeah. know, you never know who I am. I'm gonna be this complete shifting signifier. Basically, that's what began to look uh, to, to, you know, to be the, the, the stuff of post-structuralism that Stanley was looking at. Right. And that's when we go from Fordism to post Fordism, from unions who were basically unions work for capitalism because they were lev the the leverage, right? Basically, they 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 the workers in the union got uppity. You threw them more money. They were going to be consumers anyway. They were going to return it to the owners, and the system kept going. It kept getting regulated. By the time we get to the post they don't need the unions anymore because now they've learned because of the technology because of the assemblages for example how to segment the market they can produce just in time for that segment of the market we don't need big unions we don't need big warehouses we don't need mass production now it's small production for you know the punks over here the goths over there whatever it is basically cultural studies turns into that right niche marketing you know you pick your your youth culture that your subculture that you're going to study blah 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 right it, it, that's the paradigm shift it's happening to everyone right and stanley's one of the few people who's really paying attention at all the determinations as uh as uh, uh michael just said this michael not that michael uh, we said it's yeah. a multiple cause. Yeah, but the other the other thing to think about is that, I mean, listen, all technology since, or I, I would say since, you know, industrialization is an assemblage in one form or another, right? But on top of that, now what we have, as you say, you're reconstructing the grid. The fact of the matter is that Newer assemblages, those networks, for instance, which are part of the new paradigm, they are basically piggybacking on the old networks, right? The well, network yes. wasn't invented, but so for example, the cloud mm -hmm. is literally, they literally are using old communication wires that are left over from obsolete technologies, right? That are now basically the the, the stuff that's transmitting you know, our, our, our emanations to the 
to the metaphoric cloud, it's really just another network of computers, right? So that becomes too an assemblage. And certainly the screen was an assemblage, right? The street of the town, the lobby of the theater, the, the auditorium where the people sat on the screen. Basically, why did we have a society of discipline? Because mom and dad took you by the hand as you were very little, put you through all these different spaces, and now you got your gaze fixed, that gaze that those so so such theoretical problem of you know film film theory in the 1980s. It's it's a material use of space, mm -hmm. right? It's a material use of an assemblage, right? That's what the society of discipline is. It's an assemblage that's basically materially grounded. And that, you know, I mean, I got to think this way, for example, because of Stanley. So, I mean, I just want to say that. Any question for all this, uh, this abstractions here? Anybody want to make comments? Yeah, Chris, please. Yeah. Uh, more of a comment about that education. Yeah, sure. uh, as a current uh, possible student, I really do think there is a need for Stanley's approach this kind of thinking of the paradigm, about the thinking of the paradigm historically. And I just, um, uh, in my program right now, I'm so taken aback at how do students don't recognize the sort of uh, like what I would call like a paradigmatic history of the development of philosophy itself. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. Like they can tell you what they talk about, they can tell you about Katie's talking about the plays that I've been talking about. They cannot see the kind of continuity between these thinkers. It's concepts are just overlapping. So I guess I'm wondering about how this philosophy translates to philosophy in education, and then maybe an extension of that, but like as a philosophy of education. Well, Stiegler talks about, he, I mean, he wrote a whole book on universities and talked about how the universities are getting stupid, right? And that stupidity is a produced stupidity, right? Getting back to that idea of the chapter, uh, the, the fragment on machines, and Bruno also brought up the fact that what the estrangement there is knowledge, right? The proletarianization is knowledge. And that knowledge is being taken away from professors and it's taken away from students, right? So it's no wonder that neither the professors nor the students see this, right? We were very fortunate that we came from a period before this was overtaken, you know? And uh, basically CUNY was one of the first targets of that attempt. For instance, the destruction of Ostos Community College, right, by the right wing, uh, including former left-wingers, like Herman Badillo, basically targeting Ostos Community College, right? Uh, basically, that was the beginning of this whole process. So, yeah, I mean, what what you what you need is is basically Stanley's uh, sense of critique, Stanley's contrarianism, right? Stanley's, you know, we're not going to take it. There's a, there's a great phrase in uh, in Gramsci. It's a, it's a long footnote in the study of philosophy called the socialization of ideas. It's an excellent, if you go through an onto historical approach of how ideas become socialized is a really good way of beginning to look at, at uh, philosophy. You don't read Descartes the individual only, you don't read these great men in the history of philosophy. You're really looking at how the ideas become socialized in a historical, not only in the context outside of just historicism, but see the historicity of how they're made, how they're socialized, and then they're, how they're transmitted. And the interesting thing about Stiegler, again, and, and Stanley together. And I think this is something they have very much in common that was referred to by Cornell earlier this today is the care, the care of transmission, the, the taking care of generations, which is a very, very important book of uh, Bernard Stiegler, you know, uh, in, in a way, you know. And by the way, his daughter is a first rate uh, philosopher in, in Nietzsche and in, in American pragmatism, you know, and she sometimes comes to New York. Yes, yeah, yeah. And the question is to bring this back to Stanley. Yeah. Um, especially around this question of legacy. So, you know, I, I teach an undergraduate course in the We need a chapter of the context of 
And so when we read the chapter on Esther and Wonder, I'm talking about the 1990s, which is each history. Right? But they wanted to yeah. they know the price is to Right, um, right. So yeah, we're having this big conversation about this, and we're all deeply deeply deep 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 in the Iran system, right? We're all like we all have personal contact with them, we're all thinking with them, we've got lots of support, but if I go into my graduate, I don't uh, I don't uh, assign any serum environments in any of my graduate very close. And if I were to, what would I assign? What are people going to be of Stanley mm -hmm. in 50 years from now? Right? It's like the problem we have the symbol. There's like it's, a yeah, yeah. You read from the symbol. The symbol if you don't mind could we take that question in the next panel you know because it's about education and knowledge factories sure. yeah i mean you know i'm just saying it'd be interesting to have that discussion yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. unless you want to please go ahead just a very Brian, very you know, quick uh very quick response you know listen i i'm not going to predict what Arana, what stuff by Aronowitz they're going to be reading in the future. We hope that they're still reading in the future, but at this point, I'm not even ready to predict that. However, one thing that you can tell your students is that basically the same thing that is happening right now was happening then. He's writing the jobless future as we're switching to the, the web. We're switching from standalone computers to the web. And he's basically writing symptomatically to a degree, whether he's addressing the web or not, this is why he's writing that stuff. Something is happening, something is changing. And just look at the response that this man had to that transformation and feel the transformation that is happening right now. Now go do your own thinking. That's why you're reading that. Not because you're gonna get the answer from that, not because us sitting here have this magic reply that is going to solve things for everybody, because this is what allows you to go do your own thinking. As a student, you have to become active in your own thinking. Stop being the passive student that just learns for the, for the multiple choice exam. You will get maybe three students to pay attention, maybe the rest of your students will not pay attention and a few other students will not care at all, but that's going to happen no matter what you do. That's just the nature of, of our job as professors, right? But the three students that you get to, that's, that's why you're doing this job. And that's why you have to tell them, you pay attention to this because this is not exactly about your reality right now, but it's exactly about, about the operations of what's happening to you right now. Okay. I'm going to go to Lydia. Yeah, well, yeah. Just a quick, okay, go so ahead. in terms of, you know, there are these citation alerts, right? This is part of the great digital space. So I get citations alert on techno science and cyber culture, the introductory chapter every week. It is part of the canon. It's especially in Spanish and in English. There's a translated version. So it, it blows me away every month, like the number of citations of that. So that's just one example where Stanley got canonized in that field. And um, we canonized, is that the right word? Put in the yeah. canon, yeah. Okay, sounds weird. Um, <laughs> heavily but, cited, but anyway, so so that's that you know, that book really has lodged science is power in a different way. But, um, anyway, Mother Teresa, yeah. so let me let me, let me go, Lydia, and then, uh, yeah. 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 Oh, that's my Michael, that was Michael, oh, yeah. Amazing. So I just wanted to just you pepper duck. Michael Pilius, what would you say we should be doing when I'm trying to recreate that phase of the You mean uh, outside of Aronowitz or within Aronowitz? So, what <laughs> didn't, didn't. Well, I mean, I, I'm pretty good at, uh, you know, dividing up work. So I, I consider Stanley to have four major theoretical periods. I mean, I think like Yvonne Macro in, in some senses. One would be, of course, false promises, which was referred to often today. Uh, I, I like what Michael Denning uh, did this morning in terms of trying to read it as a work of fiction. 
you know, a very imaginative, radically imaginative approach to this and different. Um, secondly, the book to a crisis in historical materialism that I have here, which is not only thought provoking, but is a major intervention, I think, in, in the in the 80s. I would add to crisis in historical materials, a very short uh, piece uh, that he wrote at the uh, beginning of critical theory um, of uh, Max Horkheimer's book. He wrote an incredibly good introduction yeah. Yeah. there about where he says, not so fast to the left. You know, this is after the weather underground starts blowing up itself, right? In a sense, he's saying not so fast and the destruction of the new left. It's a very, very interesting piece. And I think Stanley at his best. Uh, the third theoretical book would, of course, be Science as Power that, uh, you know, Michael Menser referred to. A very significant book in terms of an episteme. And the fourth would be How Class Works, which is very underthought of and under undertossed. Uh, not hardly mentioned at all in the literature right now, in which he develops new theories of class. Very interesting. Class is not <laughs> the old Marxist. Peter and I in Baltimore, you know, gave a, gave a talk of that. We almost got thrown out of the room by the Orthodox Marxists. We got in big fights in the room with the uh, the Trot faction and other, you know, play, uh, things down there. But anyway, those are the four theoretical work. The rest is like Yvonne's talking to, including ju just around the corner, you know, these other books. So he always considered these occasional pieces. You know, that they were meant for intervention. When I say philosophy at one level can intervene, you know, can invent concepts and produces something new. I'm speaking of the theoretical advances that he makes and, the, you know, that he had. But the other books are really the occasional pieces. Most of the books on education, even though they're very significant, but they're meant for a reason in a, in a certain crisis in the side that he's responding to in a way. Yeah, Not so much just a paradigmatic moment no, or no, no but level. i mean yeah, cer please. certainly in how class works you can you can see examples of what would be an onto historic approach yes. where he's trying Absolutely. to basically rework wh what class is what class means mm -hmm. and he's finding certain ways to situate it too he's trying to talk about space he's trying to talk about time and how class basically is different from social formations and things like that trying to create new distinctions that are really not often done if, if at all in sociology for example and so on and so forth that's all onto historic work in that book for example so you can definitely right. see that happening there and i'll just mention i know you you came to stiegler classes and it's great to see you in person but you know the age of disruption by stiegler is worth studying of all of stiegler is worth studying but that's a book that is very sort of recent closer to his death. You know, he has a couple of others after that, the Nanjing lectures. But The Age of Disruption is an absolutely major work. And it's up your line, too. I'm, I'm talking to you, too, Lydia. About, he has a whole chapter on the debate on reason and madness between Foucault and Derrida, right? Again, he revisits these things. So there's something very interesting there. But yeah, in a way, look, the, the legacy of Stanley is so vast, at least to my mind, that we need to think about this, you know, um, in 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 many many dimensions, and what Michael Menser is doing to try to take this to the practical level, you know, his interventions with energy grid things and thinking about energy is one way. Certainly, Yvonne with Spring, some of the other of us trying to build the Institute for the Radical Imagination, keep some radical pedagogy going. You know, I certainly read differently. You know, Stanley and I used to talk, what does it mean to read? How do we read the text, right? He was always about reconstruction, reconstructing from the deconstructive maneuver. You know, he would do this. He would read Hegel, the first 72 propositions. That was it, right? The preface. He would spend half a year on the preface to the phenomenon. 72 probably. I would say, oh no, but Jean Hippolyte advises we do 73 through 89. Just the introduction. And he taught the entire French, you know, of our daughter the post 1950s and early 60s. So, anyway, these are the kind of things. But I, I think it involves, you know, in a way, our question again, and, you know, Althusser saying this in 65 the greatest tests that we have before are reading, seeing, hearing. <laughs> We're still there and much worse than it was in 65. You know, you think about the production that came out, 65 out of France, et cetera, the reading capital group, that this is a test that we're going through. This is really, I, I think, major going forward. 
and again, both Stiegler and Stanley shared this, this level of care and this level of, um, you know, transmission to generations. So I think, you know, the, the three of us were very interested in legacy, right? What do we do here? You know, what do, how do we become legatees, if you will, or avatars in some ways? Not, not as clones, not as, you know, et cetera, but people that, you know, can continue this work, thinking it through based on the influence, our conversations, our dialogue, our personal experience we had with, you know, someone named Stanley or Ronald. You know, that's what the singularity is. So anyway, Sean, I'm sorry. Uh, two questions about the grid and I <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> now we're down and dirty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, were you saying that the public school, the public you know, graduate students in science and technology, that they are science and power? Are you saying these students can kind of impact on how the grades are going to be constructed? I mean, but that was only the impression pretty much that, you know, the vision is pretty much in both sides, right? If you're saying that the students can enter into this field and through their creation of knowledge, their reason which they can create an alternative vision to the grid. Yeah. Um, so the other thing about the IDW, the IDW is not that's a section of a certain, you know, elite group. But if you had to make an argument, well, we an argument, is there an argument that could be made in the IDW? About why we should do the right thing about it, and not just go along with the business as usual transactional kind of you know thing. So when the grid was constructed between the 1880s and the 1930s. And there's a fantastic book by Thomas Hughes, uh, a German scholar, writes in English uh, called Networks of Power. It's like an 800 page book. It's awesome. Um, he talks about how new knowledges had to be produced and new institutions had to be created, including the regulatory bodies, universities, the field of electrical engineering, and, and on and on. We're in that moment. People might, I mean, CUNY's got three new buildings in the works, right? One's at LaGuardia to do the wind and energy stuff. College of Staten Island just announced they're trying to get that big blade inside the building, five, they got half a million dollars to, to do the training. Um, and Kingsborough, right? So there's actually even CUNY's in the mix on this because there's so much money that's come from the federal level to reorganize workforce development, education, training, technical side, and so on. So there's absolutely a role that this generation of students is going to play to shape it because it has not been shaped. It, no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. There's so And look, I so the, the second response is, um, I'm really deep in this stuff. So I was part of a group on Long Island to write legislation to create a commission to plot the transformation of something called the Long Island Power Authority, which contracts out the operations of the grid to a private utility, PSE&G. We're successful. And we're writing the legislation now to put that into motion. Is there combat? Absolutely, with PSE&G and so on. IBW is generally behaving for us because we're not, we're not touched in the oil and gas side. We're only on the electric side. So it's up for grabs. They don't even, uh, you know, we mentioned before about uh, the, the previous infrastructure that's utilized, right? All the oil and gas folks, that's why they want hydrogen, because they want hydrogen to be flowing through those pipes and so on. It's not really going to work. That's their idea. Biden, unfortunately, is able to uh, fund some of that. But it's really up for grabs. Anybody who tells you it's not up for grabs, they got a plan all, all laid out. No, they don't. I have to read all this crap. I have to go to all the meetings. I have to have all these hearings. Um, and they really don't. And, and a great example of the fight is something called the Building Public Renewables Act, which is in the New York State Legislature, and Hochul just created her alternative version to it, which we didn't talk about this, right, of the public, the crisis of the public, and we need a new conception of the public to be able to usher forth and own this kind of transformation that's happening, we'll do right? that next month in Skyline. All right, all right, I'm game, I'm game, and I've written on this, this is something I've written oh, on recently, you. yeah, yeah. I hear you, I really yeah. wish we had. Yeah, so, and I, yeah, and I don't want to go, and we can talk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My, my, my so, mind. so that would, and you could see the fights with the unions, with the, and in, in the state legislature over this exact question, and you can see how it's 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 up for grabs. Who owns this stuff, and how is it made accountable, and so on. Thank you, Michael. We're going to go on right away to the uh, to the the uh, knowledge factories, uh, which will bring up a few other people. I'm going to Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you.